It is the halfway point of this general election campaign, an important time to take stock. More and more people across Britain now know why we need this election. More and more people know how much is at stake for the country and for their family finances. The question becoming clearer every day is who will lead our country through the Brexit negotiations and get the best economic deal for the United Kingdom in Europe. It is clear that there are only two candidates for that job, me or Jeremy Corbyn. And where I offer strong and stable leadership in the national interest, the alternative is simply too big a risk to take. The British people will form their judgment over the coming weeks and make a decision on the 8th of June. And never before in my lifetime has the choice been so stark. Never before has the outcome of an election had such profound consequences for hard-working families. Because our future success and prosperity as a country depends on getting the next five years right. Now more than ever, Britain needs strong and stable government to get the best deal for our country. Now more than ever, Britain needs strong and stable government to make the most of the opportunities Brexit brings. And that is the clear message that I am taking right across Britain in this campaign. Since I called this election, I've held nearly 40 campaign events, travelled nearly 3,000 miles, and spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people face to face. Because while Jeremy Corbyn speaks to the narrow few, I want to speak for the many. So I've been reaching out to communities across Britain, and that is essential, because this election matters to every community. And my approach is that from the largest city to the smallest village, everyone has a role in getting the next five years right, starting with their vote. Every vote for me and my local candidates in communities across the UK will strengthen my hand in the Brexit negotiations. Every vote in every constituency will make it easier to get a better deal for Britain and the best real-world benefits for families. And there's something important that we've learned in this election. That a vote for any other party, for Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the Scottish Nationalists, the Greens, anyone, only risks making Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister with all the economic chaos that would bring. And that is too big a risk for our country to take. Because so far, every day during this campaign, Jeremy Corbyn has shown that he is simply not up to the job. He says he wants to change Britain, and that's true. But what we've learned in this campaign is that he wants to change it into the 1970s. In just three weeks, Labour have taken us back 40 years. Or maybe 400 years, according to Diane Abbott. <laughs> it, and it would be a joke if the risks weren't so profound. For this campaign has confirmed what we all suspected. Labour under Jeremy Corbyn simply can't add up. Now, Diane Abbott is the person that Jeremy Corbyn wants to put in charge of our country's borders, policing and security in just 27 days' time. And last week, she went on the radio and at one stage suggested you can employ a police officer for £30 a year. <laughs> Yesterday, Labour's leaked election manifesto revealed a multi-billion pound ideological wish list of undeliverable promises, with a budget black hole some have estimated to be at least £30 billion. They laughably claim that all of their ideas are fully funded, but what we've actually heard is a chaotic wish list of spending promises alongside billions of pounds of tax rises. That's not an economic plan, that's an economic shambles. Barely a day goes by in this campaign without them saying they will raise corporation tax to pay for their promises. But in reality, they've already spent this tax rise 12 separate ways. 
Some are reporting their plans will cost each and every family £4,000 a year. It's a manifesto that is 100% Jeremy Corbyn, with costings that are 100% Diane Abbott. Labour cannot add up, and so far in this campaign, they've retreated more and more into ideological fantasy. They've shown during this campaign that they cannot be trusted. John McDonnell, the man Jeremy Corbyn wants to put in charge of our economy. Under the glare of the studio lights on the Andrew Marr programme on Sunday, he was asked whether or not he was a Marxist. He said no. But then a video emerged of him proudly declaring to a private political gathering, I'm honest with people, I'm a Marxist. Saying one thing to the British people in public, but the opposite to his political associates in private. Now, how on earth could a maybe, maybe not Marxist be trusted over our taxes, our spending, or anything else? So we've learned for sure what we always suspected. They cannot add up, and they cannot be trusted. And during this campaign, we've learned that Jeremy Corbyn simply can't lead. Across the country, Labour candidates are disowning their leader. They don't want him to visit, they don't want him on their leaflets or on their Facebook posts. His own candidates have no confidence in him leading their party. But Jeremy Corbyn is happy to take a vote from them anyway. Because it may say Labour on the ballot, but it's Jeremy Corbyn that says thank you for every vote. But if he cannot effectively lead his party during this election, he can't possibly be ready to lead our country through Brexit in just 27 days' time. And so far, during this campaign, we've learned one other thing about Jeremy Corbyn. Proud and patriotic working-class people in towns and cities across Britain have not deserted the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn has deserted them. Millions of people here in the northeast of England and across our country have loyally given the Labour Party their allegiance for generations. I respect that. We respect that parents and grandparents taught their children and grandchildren that Labour was a party that shared their values and stood up for their community. But across the country today, traditional Labour supporters are increasingly looking at what Jeremy Corbyn believes in and are appalled. We've learned from the shambolic leak of his manifesto that at the heart of his plan, is a desire to go back to the economically disastrous socialist policies of the 1970s. Labour voters are appalled because they see a leader who can't lead, a shadow chancellor in John McDonnell who can't be trusted, and a shadow home secretary like Diane Abbott who can't add up. They see a party that once believed in hard work, now deserting those who aspire to a better life. A party that once stood for our union of nations, now being led by a man who says a second Scottish independence referendum would be absolutely fine by him. A party that once believed in patriotism, with a leader who refused to sing our national anthem. A Labour Party that first established our independent nuclear deterrent, now led by a man who wants to get rid of it, and even talks about abolishing the army. Jeremy Corbyn has disowned and rejected the core values of Labour's most loyal supporters to put his own extreme ideological obsessions first. And that is why at this election, I am determined to offer every community a positive alternative to Jeremy Corbyn's shambolic and economically irresponsible approach and the coalition of chaos that would prop him up and put him in number 10. A coalition of chaos would mean more debt, fewer jobs, higher taxes, and it would weaken Britain's negotiating position on Brexit. Let's be clear, the consequences of Corbyn at number 10 are real. Higher debt has real consequences on small businesses. Higher unemployment has real consequences for ordinary working people. Higher taxes have real consequences on families, and a weak Prime Minister would have no real bargaining position on Brexit. So I will fight to win every vote and strive to earn the trust of all our people because everyone in our country counts and everyone has a stake 
in building a better future in the months and years ahead. And that better future is within reach. So far in this campaign, we've shown that we can only make a success of our country's future if we first make a success of Brexit. And Labour have shown that they're simply not up to the job. We knew before that getting the right deal with Europe would be challenging, but we've seen during this campaign just how difficult it will be. We've seen how Britain's negotiating position has been misrepresented in the continental press, how the European Commission's negotiating stance has hardened. We've seen how the 27 remaining member states are determined to work together. We've seen that they mean business, but so do I. We've seen how important it is for Britain to show that same unity of purpose here at home. And we've seen how now more than ever, we need to be led by a prime minister and a government that has the strength to stand up for Britain. A prime minister who is prepared to say without equivocation that the United Kingdom will leave the European Union. We will regain control of our money, our borders and our laws. Over the next few weeks, we will be setting out a positive approach explaining how we will take advantage of the enormous opportunity that lies ahead for Britain as we leave the European Union. But if we do not get it right, the consequences will be serious. And every day, between now and polling day, we will be warning that a weakened Brexit bargaining position will be felt by ordinary working people across the country, because getting Brexit right is central to everything get it wrong in 27 days' time, and we will lose the chance to build a stronger, more prosperous country with real opportunity for all. And so far during this campaign, we have shown that Brexit is not simply an end in itself. People did not vote simply to change Britain's constitutional status, but to bring about real improvements in their lives, their communities, and the futures of their children and grandchildren. So we've begun to set out the policies to do it. Capping people's energy bills so that working people get to keep more of the money they earn. Protecting people's pensions from unscrupulous bosses. Tackling the burning injustice of poor mental health provision. Investing in our armed forces to keep our country safe. We've learned a lot already during this campaign. And next week, when we release our manifesto, we will set out in detail the five great challenges we face over the next five years and lay out which, what we are going to do to tackle them. We will make it clear that we cannot continue to duck these important challenges and we will be straight with people about the trade-offs we must sometimes make because that is what leadership is all about. We will not shy away from tackling the great challenges of our time. And with the strong and stable leadership of me and my team, backed by a broad coalition of the British people, we can begin to address them together. That is why I will be campaigning in all corners of this country in the 27 days ahead. I will be reaching out to those who have been abandoned by Jeremy Corbyn and let down by government for too long. I will be doing everything I can to earn their trust. And my commitment to them is this. If you put your trust in me, back me, I will work every day to build a better future for your family and our country. If you put your trust in me, back me, I will strive to be a leader worthy of our great country. If you put your trust in me, back me, I will work every day to build a Britain our children and grandchildren are proud to call home. A stronger Britain, where everyone has the economic security they need and the chance to live a secure and happy life. A fairer Britain that works for everyone, not just a privileged few. So as we reach the halfway point of this campaign, the choice is becoming ever more clear. Me and my team, with our eyes fixed on the future, or Jeremy Corbyn and his allies that want to take us back to the economic chaos of the past. Strong and stable leadership with me as Prime Minister to see us through Brexit and beyond, or a coalition of chaos 
with the shambolic Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, propped up by everyone else. I've said many times that this is the most important election in my lifetime. With every passing day of this campaign, that statement rings ever more true. For a government of chaos led by Jeremy Corbyn who can't add up, can't be trusted and can't lead would be an economic disaster for our nation. And at this crucial moment for Britain, that is simply too big a risk for anyone to take. Thank you. I, uh, I'll take a few questions from the media. I think, I think I might actually, I normally take broadcasters first. I thought, I think the Newcastle Chronicle is here. Is that right? Is Mike here from the Newcastle Chronicle? Yes? Hi, uh, welcome to the North East. Um, for seven years, the North East has probably suffered more than any other region in the UK because of austerity. Education cuts, hospitals crumbling, uh, we've even got the largest food bank in the United Kingdom. You've been played a major part in that government for seven years. What possibly could you offer the North East? What you could you offer to the North East that would reassure them that you can actually fulfil all the promises you made today? Well, first of all, let's look at what has happened over the last seven years here in the North East. We see that unemployment is down by almost a third. Uh, we see that there are actually more doctors and more nurses in the NHS in the North East. We see that over 47,000 more children are in good or outstanding schools here in the North East, getting a better opportunity, a better start in life. But as I said in my speech, as I look at uh, the North East and look at the future, first of all, if I, you know, when I stood in the North East back 25 years ago. I stood in County Durham for election to Parliament. And there were quite a few Labour voters in that, uh, in that constituency. <laughs> But what I found when I talked to those Labour voters were people who were really patriotic. They loved their country. They took great pride in their region. They wanted to see a better future for themselves and their children. They wanted to see good school places for their children. They wanted good jobs in their region. Now, if you look at those issues, it's not the Labour Party who is offering that to people. It's Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn, as I said, he didn't sing the national anthem. He's uh, refused. He said that we might consider abolishing the army. He's not prepared to defend our country. And they would wreck the economy, and that would mean not more jobs and better paid jobs, but fewer jobs and businesses going under, and less money to put in the NHS and schools. It's the Conservative Party, it's me and my team today, who are offering people that brighter future by building a strong economy that will provide the funding for our uh, schools and hospitals by building the strong economy that will encourage the growth of businesses, creating new jobs and higher skilled jobs and higher paid jobs, and by changing education so we ensure there's a good school place for every child. That is a brighter future for our country. It's a brighter future for the North East, and it's what me, I and my team are offering at this election. I will take uh, Laura. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you've said you wouldn't duck the challenges of our time. You've talked a lot about patriotism today. Would, it, would you think it patriotic to join the United States in more strikes against Syria? Or will you rule out having a parliamentary vote on that when you return to Parliament, if you win? Look, we are, as you know, the uh, United Kingdom is part of the coalition that is operating in Syria and Iraq with the United States, but with other countries too, to ensure that we are acting to defeat Daesh, that terrorist group that poses a real threat to us here in the United Kingdom, um, but also uh, is working not just in that action, but diplomatically with others to ensure that we can see uh, a stable Syria for the future and a political transition for Syria away from Assad. When I look at the decisions that I'll be taking in terms of defense and foreign policy, there's one thing that will drive those decisions, and that is that those decisions will be taken in the British national interest. Sky. Thank you, Prime Minister. Robert Nisbet. Um, 
Is it true that the Conservative Party is selecting candidates with a softer view on Brexit in order to avoid what your predecessor called yesterday an extreme Brexit? We are selecting the candidates who are going to do a good job as members of Parliament for their constituencies when they're elected. We're selecting candidates who will listen to uh, uh, the issues raised by their constituents, who will campaign and work with a Conservative government to provide a better future for those constituencies. Uh, and we're selecting candidates who will stand up and every vote for whom will mean that we're strengthening our hand in those Brexit negotiations and getting a better deal for the United Kingdom. What we're doing is selecting good candidates around the whole of the United Kingdom. And uh, ITV, sorry, Eleanor. Emily Morgan, uh, sorry, ITV. Emily. <laughs> it's all right. sorry. Emily Morgan, ITV News. Prime Minister, aren't you living in a fantasy world if you really think you can win a significant number of votes from those working class Labour voters that you say you can here? No, and I would say to you, just, just look actually, at, I mean, Tynemouth used to be a Conservative held seat. Um, the, the, in recent years, relatively recent years, we've had a Conservative mayor in North Tyneside. Uh, so, you know, what matters, I think, when people come to that vote on June the 8th is the crucial choice that they will face about the future of this country and about who they want to see leading this country because there is only going to be one of two people, Prime Minister on the 9th of June. It's either me or Jeremy Corbyn. So the choice they face is that strong and stable leadership, a vote for me and my local candidates that will strengthen our hand and strengthen the UK's position in those Brexit negotiations, or a vote for any other party that would risk putting Jeremy Corbyn into number 10 with a coalition of chaos that would wreck our economy and be weak in those Brexit negotiations. That is the choice that people will face. It's not about how they have voted before. It's about the choice they will be making for the future of our country at this election. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister Ben Glaze, Daily Mirror. Um, if a Tory government is re-elected on June 8th under your leadership, by 2022, will food bank use have gone up or down? Look, nobody wants to see uh, food bank use in this country, but food banks are not something that has suddenly happened in the last few years. We saw food banks being used under the last Labour government. One of the issues I uh, challenged the last Labour government on when I was in opposition was the fact that they refused to let job centre staff pinpoint people, point people to food banks when they were really in need and could have benefited from them. Now, we changed that. But if you're going to deal with the issue of food banks so that people don't have to go for, to food banks, what you need is to ensure you've got a strong economy with higher paid jobs uh, so that people are able to provide for themselves and their families. And you don't get that by making billions of pounds of spending promises with, uh, as I've said in my speech, uh, a, a manifesto that some say has a black hole of £30 billion pounds in it. Uh, Labour's policies would wreck our economy. That would mean fewer jobs. That would mean fewer people without the income to support their families. Take, yes. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Claire Ellicott from the Daily Mail. Um, you've spoken of the challenges facing this country and how you're not duck tackling them. Um, is the social care crisis one of those challenges? And can you absolutely rule out any increase in post-death taxes to provide funding to tackle it? There is. We absolutely recognise the pressure on social care. And the, uh, we do face a challenge of an ageing population and how we ensure that we can provide for that ageing population. And we've already, I've always said on social care, I think there are short-term, medium-term and long-term solutions. In the short term, more money has been put in. Obviously, councils were given the opportunity now for the 3% uh, precept for social care in this and next year. Uh, we have, in the budget, put £2 billion pounds more into, uh, into social care. And, but the, there's a medium-term issue about ensuring best practice is uh, prevalent around the country. And the long-term issue is about the sustainability of social care for the long term. And obviously, we'll be publishing our manifesto uh, next week. And uh, I'm afraid if you want to know what's in the manifesto, you'll have to wait for the manifesto. It's a nice try, but um, I'll, take, I'll take two more questions. One on the end there, and then LBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Kate McCann from the Daily Telegraph. Can I ask, given the problems with Southern Rail uh, and the fact that the East Coast Main Line made a profit for the taxpayer when it was in public ownership, is there now a case for uh, some or part of Britain's railways to be renationalised? 
No, let's look at what's happened since the railways were privatised. Actually, we've seen, I think it's virtually double the number of passengers using the railways. We see enhanced services on our railways. And uh, that is important because what matters is the service that is being offered to the public. And the privatisation of our railways has actually led to an improvement in service and to, as I say, more passengers using our railways. And that's good news. I don't think taking us back to the uh, days of British Rail and I'm old enough to remember what the railway service was like in the days of British Rail, it has come on significantly under privatised companies. They're more focused on the service that they're offering to the passengers. And now LBC. Hi, Sam Thompson, LBC. Uh, before and after last summer's referendum, we heard warnings about the North East potentially being hardest hit by any negative economic impacts of Brexit. What measures are you going to take as Prime Minister specific to the North East to make sure that those prophecies don't come true? Well, of course, and since the referendum, we've had the very good news for the North East of the investment that Nissan is putting in the North East for the future. And that is not just about a government that wants to ensure that our automotive industry is competitive for the future. It's actually a huge um, a, a complement to the work ethic and the, the standards of work of workers here in the North East. Uh, now, what are we doing as we look across the country? Because I do want to ensure that economic growth and prosperity is spread around the country. Our modern industrial strategy is about looking at which sectors of the economy we should be encouraging. What is the economy of the future that we should be helping to grow? Where should we be seeing clusters of expertise in our economy? And we're working with businesses here in the Northeast and around the rest of the country to say what actually makes sense for encouraging that growth in our economy, for bringing more investment in and bringing more jobs. But as I say, the North East uh, already has a great record, particularly in the automotive industry, but in other, other areas as well. And it's about building on those uh, positives that we already see in areas like this. But it's about, crucially, ensuring we're bringing more jobs, higher paid jobs, and a better future for people in the North East and elsewhere. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.